Hi, uh, Chem212 students. Welcome back for our last lecture this week. And now we're going to begin to talk about the physical properties of molecules that have optical isomers and, and the reason why they're called optical isomers. Um, and so uh, there, are, there are kind of two names for structures of enantiomers. They're, called, they're also called optical isomers, and that's because they have a property uh, that says they are optically active, which is important because if you look at the other physical properties, of two enantiomers, they tend to be, they will be exactly the same. Uh, and so, for example, for these two optical isomers here, where the chiral carbon is right here, they have the same melting point, the same boiling point. So if you want to tell the difference between them, it's very, it's very difficult to separate them. Uh, often we'll separate things by uh, boiling off the one that is easier to boil. It has a lower boiling point and then we'll get more of that uh, substance in the vapor. We can't use that method of distillation, as it's called, to separate two optical isomers from one another. Uh, so how would we determine how much of each we have? How can we distinguish from one from the other? Well, the answer lies in the way that these two uh, enantiomers would rotate plane polarized light. You guys might have heard of polarized sunglasses. Uh, these are sunglasses that block out the light, uh, a certain percentage of the light, and only let through that, that which is uh, traveling in a wave that has a certain orientation. So light travels in a wave. It's an electromagnetic field, as they call it. And the electric field and the magnetic field propagate uh, perpendicular to one another. And so, and so this uh, light generally will come in uh, that in a, a, a form that is not polarized. It will be in all directions. However, if we pass this light through a certain lens, such as the lens in a polarized sunglasses, what will only be allowed through is the light that is propagating in a certain up and down direction for its electric field. Uh, so what we can do is we can have uh, a series of lenses here that will allow only light of a certain polarization to pass through. And when we pass this through a pure chiral compound, the polarization of the light will be rotated. Uh, the mechanism for that is, is quite complicated, but this is, can be observed in the lab, and we will observe it in the lab. We say that these molecules that rotate plane polarized light are optically active, and enantiomers tend to be optically active. Um, so as we can see here, if we've, this, is, this, uh, this diagram is one of a a tool that's called a polarimeter, and that's a tool that we will use in lab. And uh, what happens is you have one lens to allow plane polarized light through uh, to a sample tube. When that light passes through the tube, depending on the length of the tube uh, and the, the identity of the substance, the, plane polari the, the polarization of the light will be rotated by a certain number of degrees. And we can rotate another lens until we see the light come through. Uh, then we know we'll know the polarization of the light and how much it was rotated relative to where it went in. So, two enantiomers will rotate the plane of light in equal amounts but in opposite directions. So, when you have an exact mixture, 50/50 uh, of both, the net polarization of the light will be zero. It will rotate the the plane of the polarization by zero. But if you have more of one enantiomer in a mixture than another, then there will be a net rotation of the polarization of the light and it will depend on the concentration of the substance in a solution that is in a sample tube like the one we saw in the diagram and the length of the pathway which is customarily one decimeter or 10 centimeters uh, and we would measure what's called the specific rotation which is the the angle of rotation of the polarized light divided by uh, the path length uh, and uh, a constant for that compound, uh, that, or the concentration rather. Uh, so concentration, and so it depends on the concentration uh, and also the length. Uh, and so what we do is the specific rotation corrects for the concentration and length and makes it a, a uniform measurement, which we call the specific rotation. Uh, also designated is the temperature. Uh, the, the rotation of light will depend on temperature and also what is the wavelength of the light being used. So a certain specific wavelength of light will be specified. Let's say we have two, uh, two compounds here, R-bromobutane and S-bromobutane. So the R enantiomer will rotate the plane polarized light in one direction 
which and so we're going to call one of the directions negative the other positive um, and uh, so it, in for one one of these uh, enantiomers the, the, the light will be rotated in one direction for the other in the other uh, but they are rotated by the same amount uh, here you can see that it specified what is the temperature 20 degrees Celsius and then a D is written here and that represents the sodium so-called D line which has a fixed wavelength of 589 nanometers. It's important to note, this is really important, there's no relationship between the RNS designation and the direction of the light, negative or positive, negative counterclockwise, positive clockwise. Uh, and so it's, it's important to note that this must be observed experimentally, empirically, uh, from data. Uh, the negative is called laboratory, meaning left, uh, left rotation, uh, uh, counterclockwise. Dextratory is right, uh, clockwise rotation of the light. Um, and so uh, for here we have another optically active molecule here. Again, here's a chiral center. And so uh, we have a, a, you know, an R and S uh, situation. This is an optically active molecule, and so it will uh, rotate the plane polarized light. Uh, the magnitude and the direction uh, cannot be predicted from the structure. You can only determine it experimentally, as I said. Uh, and if you have a racemic mixture, so this is an important term that we're going to be using a lot. A racemic mixture means it has equal amounts of both of the two enantiomers. So you would have predict the optical rotation, it would be zero. These rotations would cancel each other out. However, uh, if you had a, 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 a sample um, that is pure in one enantiomer, you could measure the optical rotation. Can you predict the optical rotation of 2-methylbutane? No, you can only determine experimentally. That's really important. Okay. Uh, it, it, I mean, there, there are complicated calculations that could be done to try, but uh, Practically speaking, you really have to measure it in the, uh, in the lab. So how could we determine, based on the optical rotation, the percentage of one enantiomer versus the percentage of another? And recall, this is here the, uh, was the R enantiomer. This is the S. So in this case, the R is ro rotating the plane of light in the counterclockwise direction. The S is rotating in the clockwise direction again. R and S cannot tell you this. Uh, but let's say we have a mixture that has an op optical rotation of 4.6 positive. Uh, well, what that tells us first it does, is that there's more of the S enantiomer in the, uh, in the uh, sample than the R. And we can calculate how much more based on this rotation. Uh, we call that the enantiomeric excess. So there's an enantiomeric excess of the S. What, by what percentage? We can figure this out by dividing the observed specific rotation by the specific rotation of the pure enantiomer. And notice these, these are the absolute values. We'll determine which is more based on the sign. So we're, we determine there's more of the S because the sign is positive. So the question is how much more? We take the 4.6 observed. We divide by the previously observed and known optical rotation 23.1 and if we want to make that a percentage we can get a decimal here the decimal would be if you put it in your calculator it's 0 0.199 uh, we can go ahead and do that uh, 4.6 divide by 23.1 and we get uh, 0 0.199 or we, if we multiply, if we make that a percent by multi multiplying it by 100%, we get 19.9%. Okay, so we have 19.9% more of the S in antimer than the R. If we wanted to figure out how much exactly we have, well, we know that the R and the S are going to add up to 100%, right? We also know that there's 19.9% more of the S than the R. So if we did the percentage of S minus the percentage of R, that difference would be 19.9%. So if we manipulate this algebraically and add R to both sides, we get that S equals uh, R plus 19.9%. Okay.
And now if we take that and we plug that S right in here, we get uh, R, we get R plus R plus 19.9% equals 100% altogether. So we get 2R plus 19.9% equals 100%. Uh, oops, I'm going behind my head here. I'm going to go upwards. Sorry, guys. Um, and so we get, if we subtract 19.9% from both sides, we get 2R equals 80.1%. Uh, and so if we divide both sides by 2, we get R equals, uh, I'll round to three sig figs, we get 40.1%. So the R is 41.1% 40 of the mixture. And so that means the remaining S, 100% minus 40.1%. Uh, would be 59.9% and you can see the difference is 19.8 19.9 we have a little difference due to rounding but uh, So that's how you could figure out what percentage of each enantiomer you have uh, likewise If we have the percentage of each we can figure out uh, the enantiomeric excess here 70% uh, of this is uh, R and 30% is S, and we could figure out the specific what the specific rotation would be too. Uh, here, the enantiomeric excess, and this is of R, so now there's going to be more R, I, I, because I was told there's more R. Uh, this equals 70% uh, minus 30%, so the enantiomeric excess is 40%, okay? And again, the alpha over the measured rotation, 23.1 times 100% equals the enantiomeric excess. I'm going to do this with decimals. So this is 0 0.4, 0 0.40. Okay. Uh, and so what would be the actual observed optical rotation? It would be the 23.1. Uh, times 0 0.40 so 23.1 times 0 0.4 equals and so we get 9.2 uh, 9.2 and the the sign on this you have to determine based on that what there's more of there's more r which has a rotation in the negative direction so the specific rotation for this mixture would be 9.2. So that is one way we can tell uh, how much of one enantiomer we have relative to another. And as I said at the beginning of the lectures this week, this is really important for drug discovery and drug purification. Uh, sometimes one enantiomer is completely ineffective and the other one is effective. Sometimes the one enantiomer is actually uh, needs to be removed. It's harmful. And, and, uh, and so separating enantiomers is extremely difficult because as we said, they don't really differ much in terms of physical properties. They'll have the same density, they'll have the same, all of the same physical properties except the optical rotation. Uh, so <clears throat> now, uh, now that we know the, way that, the ways that we could uh, differentiate between enantiomers, Let's talk a little bit more about how we can, based on their structures, predict whether they're enantiomers, diastereomers, and what kind of isomer we have. Uh, as we were talking about earlier, cis-trans isomers are a subset of a larger subset of of, uh, or, uh, of diastereomers. So these are not mirror images of one another. However, their arrangement of atoms in three-dimensional space is different. So these are a type of diastereomers. So how how will we, practically speaking, uh, tell the difference in structures between an enantiomer and a diastereomer. Let's take a look. So if we see this molecule, first of all, the stereochemistry is not shown. We don't have wedges or dashes here. Uh, we have four possible structures, some of which are, uh, are mirror images of one another and some of which are not. So if we, need, if we wanted to go through each of the different possibilities, well, one possibility would be here. 
where they're both wedges like this and this is the OH so that's uh, that's one possibility and you also have the mirror image of that which would be the enantiomer so if we took the mirror image and remember we have two ways to draw the mirror images right we can draw it with a mirror image plane like I just did just now I made everything the same but it was a mirror image or equivalently speaking if we took this whole thing and flipped it like a pancake what would happen is that we flipped both of these so these are our two these are enantiomers of one another but there are also diastereomers that are not mirror images of this so an enantiomer or sorry a stereoisomer that would not be a mirror image of this would be one in which the OH group is is on the opposite side of the ring as the methyl group. And then the enantiomer of that would be the mirror image, of which there are many ways to draw it, but one way you could draw it is by simply having a mirror plane like that. And the mirror plane is right here. And these are the four, uh, four isomers here, the four uh, stereoisomers. Now, these are considered enantiomers. So in the box, I have enantiomers here. This is an enantiomer of this. This is an enantiomer of this. And because they're mirror images. But the relationship between these two, these ones are related to these ones. They're diastereomers. Stereomers. They are, they are stereoisomers, but they're not mirror images of one another. So within the box, they're enantiomers. Between the boxes, they're diastereomers. And so you can see here, in this example, we had two uh, chiral carbons. They were here and here. And we ended up with four enantiomers. Okay. And what we're going to see is that the number of en enantiomers is going to be 2 to the n, where n is the number of chiral carbons. Now, this isn't always true. Uh, we're going to have to watch out for certain possibilities of a, uh, um, a, a internal plane of symmetry, like here. If these were two the same group, we would not have the same situation. We'll talk about that. That's going to be called meso. Uh, but here, there are two different substituents. So we get these four, uh, four stereoisomers. Uh, and, two pairs of, diaster of, of enantiomers. If we've got three chiral carbons, like this, we have eight. So three chiral carbons, so our number of stereoisomers is two to the three, eight. Uh, and here, we've used the other strategy for drawing them. So notice we have one isomer where all of these are wedges. It's an enantiomer. We could get that by drawing a mirror image like I did on the last slide, or you can simply take every single wedge and invert it. That will also get you the mirror image. Uh, I encourage you to try it. Uh, I can, I'm going to do this in mole view real quick. Uh, mole view, mole view, mole view, mole view. Mole view. So if I make this structure really quick, um, and it's going to be hard to see uh, because it's so three-dimensional. But I can have wedge, wedge, wedge. And let's say I'm, I'm, I'm just going to make these three different things. They don't necessarily have to be uh, the exact atoms. Uh, but what you'll see is, see how these are all wedges, right? If we make a 3D, we're going to get the chair configuration. So we've got some on axial, some on equatorial. Uh, but they're all, notice they're all... Uh, I'm missing hydrogens here. That's concerning. Uh, but what you can do is you can flip these, essentially. And that's what's going on here. So if we took this and we flipped it like a pancake, if we flipped it across this axis right here, then all of these that are pointing away would be in the front and you would have the mirror image. So there's two ways to draw the enantiomer. Draw, make a mirror plane, draw the mirror image, or invert all the positions at each chiral carbon. Okay. 
And that's just the strategy that's used here. So these are diastereomers of one another because notice we have up, up, up here. Now we have up, up, down. Okay. And then if we invert all of the positions, we get the enantiomer. Then we have another diastereomer. Up, down, up. And if we invert all the positions, we get the enantiomer. Then we have a last one. Up, down, down. And we invert all the positions, we get the last one. So we have eight stereoisomers, four pairs of enantiomers. Okay, so within the box, these are enantiomers. Between the boxes, they would be referred to as diastereomers. So as I said before, the maximum number of stereoisomers is 2 to the n power, where n is the number of chiral carbons. So here's a, a chiral, car chiral molecule, cholesterol. Let's find the chiral carbons on it uh, attached to four different things. This one here is chiral. Uh, this one here, chiral. It's, it's, but it's attached to two carbons, but those go on and attach to very different things. Uh, this carbon right here, chiral. This one here, chiral. Four different things. Okay, this one here as well. This one here as well. Uh, this one too, and this one too. And that's all of them. The rest either have two hydrogens or two methyls attached. Uh, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, so the number of stereoisomers would be two to the eighth power. Two to the eighth power. So if you wanted to calculate it in your calculator, two to the eighth power. Uh, so there are um, 256 possible uh, stereoisomers to cholesterol. Okay, let's take a look. Now let's say we have two molecules. We want to know, how are these related? Are they diastereomers? Are they enantiomers? Well, let's look at the difference between them. Notice that we have two chiral carbons, one right here and one right here. And let's take note the differences between them. If we look, this chirality has been inverted and so is the other one. So these must be enantiomers of one another. These are enantiomers. There are mirror images. It's not so obvious, right? You would have to really like think about it, rotate this thing in your mind, uh, and, and you would find that they're not superimposable, though, uh, as, uh, as mirror images of one another, um, because these two positions have been swapped. Uh, let's see. All right. So uh, now one thing we have to be concerned with is that if we have a compound with multiple chiral centers, uh, something can happen. And that is that the molecule can within it contain an internal plane of symmetry. And that will make the overall molecule not chiral. So this can happen when you have an even number of chirality centers. Uh, so for example here, we have uh, the 1,2-dimethyl cyclohexane. If there is an internal plane of symmetry, these will, not, uh, these, these will not be chiral. And this is true in the cis case. There is an internal plane of symmetry right here, whoops, uh, right down the middle. And so this is going to be what we call a meso compound, the cis one and will not be chiral. Uh, so both of these have chirality centers, but only one is chiral, because the cis 1,2-dimethylcyclohexane has an internal plane of symmetry. Uh, so what we have is two compounds uh, where the optical activity will be canceled, uh, similar to how mirror image enantiomers cancel out each other's rotation. So you won't have an optically active molecule here. Uh, so molecules with an even number of chirality centers that have a plane of symmetry are called meso. And so that's something you have to watch about. Uh, a way to test if a compound is meso is to get its mirror image and then flip it like a pancake. And you'll notice it's actually the same thing. Uh, so the, the, there's actually not optical isomers for, for cis-1,2 
dimethylcyclohexane. It's actually can be superimposed on its ear mirror image. It's exactly the same thing. Uh, we can we can do this very simply if we draw the Hayworth projection. We'll see. So if we draw a Hayworth projection for this, and it's on the same side, and then we draw its mirror image. <clears throat> Uh, or let's it's even easier if we do it this way if we flip both chirality positions like this if you take this and you flip it over like a pancake so if we flip this uh, over this plane right here we're gonna flip it then what you get is exactly the same molecule these two are the same. So they're not enantiomers of one another. They're actually exactly the same molecule. Uh, so watch out when you have uh, an even number of chiral centers because you may have a meso compound that, although it has this num even number of chiral centers, the molecule overall is not, uh, is not optically active because it's actually the exact, there's no difference between the mirror image and the molecule itself. Uh, <clears throat> so here's another example where we have two OHs, again, both in the wedge position. There's a plane of symmetry right through the middle. And so uh, for each, each situation like this, you'll have uh, uh, less stereoisomers. Uh, you have to remove the N from the formula, so you'll have two less every time this happens. Uh, and so we're, we're going, if you... For the same reasons, I'm not going to draw it again, but for the same reasons, if we draw the mirror image, it's exactly the same molecule. We can rotate it. And that's, all, uh, that's not true for when it's trans. Uh, at, that, at that point, you don't have a plane of symmetry anymore, so it will not be meso. So here we're asked to determine the relationship between these uh, two compounds that we have here. Uh, analyze both of them to see if they are meso compounds or not so we have two chiral carbons there's one right here and one right here Let's say that here and here so the question is are are they meso compounds or not uh well let's take a look uh this is one of those things that can be difficult uh what we're looking for is a, a plane of symmetry in in the molecule uh and so here, uh, what we've got is, what we want to do is we'll want to take this and we we'll want to rotate some of these. So if, and this can be difficult to do in your mind. We can use the, the simplifying rules that we did when we were, uh, when, when we were analyzing R and S. So here, if we were to rotate around this bond here instead, we would have this instead going down like that. And now instead of being behind the page, this would be a wedge. And then we'll have this. Okay. And uh, when we look here, now there's only one more thing to rotate uh, to make th these look the same. And that would be if we rotate around this bond right here. Uh, and we want to rotate it. Uh, so for this, it can be useful to, to use the little trick that we had with the switching of positions. So, <clears throat> so if we had a dash here, that would be the hydrogen, right? Uh, so this is the dash here, it's the hydrogen, and we've got a wedge here. So what we can do here is, uh, <clears throat> what we want to do is we want to switch this ethyl so that it's at the uh the so it's in a wedge position and so we need to rotate this a little bit we want to rotate it so that the methyl position is the plane in the plane of the page and if we're doing that we're pushing that one back and so that that would, that would mean here is that this one will move to the front and so if we're rotating that bond at that point we would have we're rotating it not a full turn around we're ro rotating it a third of a turn so that puts the ethyl on the wedge here. That puts the methyl in the plane of the page. And then the rest is the same. 
okay and uh, finally we have the hydrogen uh, which would now be in the position let's see we have oh, the methyl sorry this is the methyl is uh, yeah it's going to be in the plane of the page the hydrogen is still in the back so we have the same molecule uh, these are these are me it is a meso compound due to its symmetry uh, you can see the symmetry we can draw uh, uh, see yeah so if we and we can also see if we rotated this till it was flat in the page we'd have a, a symmetrical molecule as well so that's the other way you could analyze it if you rotated this such that the the ethyl group was in in the uh the the plane of the page you'd have it here you'd have the methyl group popping out you'd have everything else uh it, we we have this one right here and so what you'd end up with with is, is, is a symmetrical molecule it has a plane of symmetry uh, in it rather uh, sorry I drew that a little bit incorrectly let me fix that so what I meant to do was I meant to rotate this like this sorry and I wanted to put the um, this methyl group here in the wedge position. So I'm pulling it forward like this, and I'm putting it in the wedge position here, uh, which then puts the ethyl group like that. And then you can see, and I, I'm supposed to have one extra carbon in here that I'm my line is not showing very well. And so what this results in is a plane of symmetry in the molecule, and that's why it's meso. Uh, so when you rotate it, you notice that it's exactly the same molecule, actually. Uh, and, and just like if you, if, well, what we're doing with these cyclohexanes, if you flip them and rotate them, you find out they're not optical isomers of one another. They're actually the exact same molecule. And so that's why they're meso. Uh, there are situations where compounds do not have a plane of symmetry and are still achiral. Uh, so when, when you take the mirror image of this, if you draw the mirror image, you actually get exactly the same molecule, uh, uh, even though it's not perfectly symmetrical somewhere. And so if we draw the mirror image of this molecule, let's make this the plane of the page. Let's draw a mirror image. We have an oxygen here. We have this wedged carbon here. We have the nitrogen here. We have a double bond to oxygen here. And we have a dash here. Okay, and uh, whoops, I got the oxygen in the wrong place. Remove that, Let's fix that. The oxygen should actually be up here. Oh, no, no, wait, I, I got this oxygen in the wrong place. All right, sorry about that, guys. Uh, let's fix this. So, all right. So I'm trying to do the mirror image. Let's do the closest one, closer one first. So this oxygen is the mirror image of this one. This is the nitrogen. That's the mirror image of this nitrogen. This double bond to oxygen is the mirror image of this oxygen over here. And this nitrogen right here. Uh, and so what we can see is if we flip this molecule, vertically if we take it and we flip it like a pancake vertically what we'll see is that this oxygen goes into the down position this one goes into the up position all the positions flip and you get exactly the same molecule okay. uh, so this is challenging right this is difficult what we just did making sure that we have a meso com uh, seeing if we have a meso compound or not this actually involves rotating these molecules in your mind so this is where models can help a lot okay uh, but you will get better at kind of flipping these remember if we flip this like a pancake for example we're just just flipping every every orientation around uh, the re the reason for this the fact that this is meso 
is due to a, a certain kind of symmetry that results in when you flip it vertically like this. So this gets flipped up to here. This nitrogen is now down here. Uh, this is a dash and now and this is a wedge because the, uh, or sorry, this is, uh, this is a wedge, sorry. So this dash here gets flipped and so now it's a wedge and this wedge gets flipped down to the bottom so it's a dash and so then uh, the nitrogen here is in this spot the oxygen is in this spot and so when we flip this so I flipped it vertically like I'm flipping a pancake now I end up with the same structure I had over here and so that is you there's no real shortcut uh, to, to actually manipulating the molecule to catch if it's miso or not uh, you have kind of some unique situations like this one so you have to watch out be careful if you have an even number of chirality centers watch out for meso compounds uh, another way of representing chiral molecules is with so-called fissure projections so fissure projections are kind of a simplified wedge and dash structure uh, so here we have a chiral carbon we can tell because this carbon at this intersection is attached to four different groups in a in a fissure structure what the way that it is arranged it's arranged such that the horizontal groups represent groups that are popping out of the page so for example this would be the horizontal groups popping out at you like looking at it like this and the vertical groups are the ones that are in, in the dashes away from you and so another way to simplify this is often what people do is when they want to represent the Fisher structure, what they'll do is they'll kind of simplify it by turning their view, okay? And the result is that you put one vertical carbon uh, in uh, on the plane of the page and one vertical one as a dash, and then one horizontal one as a wedge because when you look at it like this, one of the horizontals is a wedge, one of the verticals uh, is a dash. And so that's a little bit easier than seeing it like this because you put two in the plane of the page. But this is what it's represented by this, which is a so-called Fisher projection. Uh, Fisher projections are usually used to show the structures of carbohydrates. So these are all carbohydrates, and you'll learn more about carbohydrates later. Uh, but it's very useful because carbohydrates have many chiral centers. Uh, so for example, this molecule here has a chiral center right here and right here. This carbon does not have a chiral center because it has two hydrogens attached. Uh, so every, in, in a Fisher projection, every one of these, um, these, uh, cro these carbons here that is at the T type cross there is a chiral carbon. Now again, you have to watch out for meso uh, with an even number of chiral carbons. But this is, uh, this is uh, how a Fisher projection works. Uh, Fisher projections are very useful for assessing uh, uh, stere stereoisometric relationships. Okay, uh, so here we have two enantiomers of one another, and here we have two diastereomers. So you can see their enantiomers very easily when you know you have this kind of like uh, plane of symmetry between them. So this looks like the optical isomer of this one. Uh, and you can see now that these are switched, these are no longer uh, optical isomers, they're no longer enantiomers, they're diastereomers. So this way of drawing structures is very useful for differentiating between uh, enantiomers and diastereomers. Uh, particularly when you study carbohydrates, you're going to use this a lot. Uh, interconverting between enantiomers uh, is the topic of section 8 of the chapter. Uh, so we already determined that cis 1,2-dimethylcyclohexane is meso, and we could tell due to the plane of symmetry. Uh, however, you'll notice that the strategy that we used is we took it out of the cyclohexane configuration and put it into a Hayworth projection uh, because it really helps to, with identifying the achiral uh, meso compound. Now, in the actual chair structure, there's not really a plane of symmetry, so if we have... Let's make, we're going to make our methyls the, uh, we're going to make the methyls both in the upward position here, up here, up here. We'll put some hydrogens to differentiate. So the hydrogens are both in the down position. Uh, 
like that. And the methyls are both in the up position. But this, when you look at the actual structure, it does not really look like it has a plane of symmetry. What's really going on is that the, the ring is flipping all the time. And so the net, there's a net symmetry because at some point they end up kind of like this. Uh, so which, which of these conformation better represents the actual structure? The one on the left, but in terms of analyzing the structure, the one on the right, even though it's not exactly accurate, it's useful for our analysis. And that happens a lot. That's kind of the way uh, valence bond theory works too. Does hybridization really occur? I think that's hard to say, but is it useful for analyzing um, the shape and the geometries of molecules and understanding it? Absolutely. Yeah. And so that's why we use it. And so, so forth. Uh, so, so also true with Hayworth images. Are they accurate to the three-dimensional structure of the molecule? No. Uh, um, you know, Lewis structures aren't always that, but they are useful for analyzing whether a compound is meso or not. Uh, <clears throat> So certainly it's not superimposable on its chair mirror image. It has two chirality centers and no actual plane of symmetry, but because it can ring flip between the two conformations, its structure can be considered an average between the two. And the result is that uh, because it can inter interconvert between these, it's achiral. If it were stuck in one position or the other, if it were stuck in a chair position always there, it would not be considered chiral, uh, 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 or it would be considered chiral, but because it can change, it's not. And so that's where the, uh, the, the kind of differentiation between conformers, calling them uh, in, in antiomers or diastereomers of one another, can we do that? Yes. It's a little misleading though, because since they can change, their bonds can rotate, really their real structure is kind of between the two conformations. Uh, and so because these freely interconverting uh, mirror images uh, they cancel out their eye, uh, optical rotation so it's kind of like having a mixture of an eye optical isomer and the other uh, there ends up being no net rotation of, uh, of the polarized light and so and this so these are considered achiral again this analysis is it's helpful to have the visual models, you know, that you can feel in your hands and, and use, and you can see what's equatorial here, what's axial. Uh, you can see that there's not exactly a plane of uh, symmetry, but because it's freely interconverting between the two forms, uh, it, it's really uh, not stuck in any one chiral arrangement. Whoops. So, I've skipped section 5.9. I don't really focus very hard on it. I think you should read it, but I'm not going to ask any questions about it. Uh, I think it's pretty clear what's uh, that these are, are, are achiral. Some certain other situations are achiral due to lack of rotation, or are chiral, rather, due to lack of rotation. Depends on the, the ability to move, like those two enantiomers that we just, or the two uh, uh, con confirmations of the chair, two chair confirmations that we just saw. Uh, so, one challenge with uh, the, the production, the synthesis, and the usage of chiral molecules, particularly for pharmaceutical or biological applications, is that two co uh, compounds that are enantiomers of one another have just about the same physical properties. They have the same melting and boiling points. They have the same polarity and solubility properties. So we've already started to investigate ways in which we might separate uh, one substance from another in a mixture. We, used, we did recrystallization, where we, did, we separated two substances from one another, two compounds, based on their solubilities. But two enantiomers are equally soluble in the same solvent, so we can't use recrystallization to separate them. Distillation is another way that we'll learn about to separate two compounds. However, Distillation requires uh, to the fact that the two compounds will boil at different, and will have different boiling points, and will bo and will have different vapor pressures and vaporize to a different extent than one another, which will allow for their separation. That's not the case for enantiomers. So how do we separate them from one another? Well, 
for a long time, uh, the existence of, of anatomy tumors was unknown uh, because there there was really no way to tell the difference between one and another, another sim simply. The way that uh, enantiomers were discovered was uh, there were crystals grown of a particular amine, uh, a particular compound here uh, that was being studied called tartaric acid. It's a uh, diprotonated acid. And these were uh, left out and they ended up crystallizing. And uh, a scientist in the mid-1800s named Louis Pasteur noticed a kind of uh, mirror symmetry to the shapes of the crystals that just so happened to form because of the, the, the slow formation of the crystals. And so what he was able to do was separate them based on their macroscopic crystalline properties and then conduct tests on them. And later it was determined that these were, op uh, these were enantiomers of one another and optical activity uh, was discovered. They both rotated plane polarized light in a different way. And so those are the only real practical ways of separating enantiomers. It's based on visually inspecting their crystalline structure, which is not, uh, you know, economically viable in a, uh, in, in a production capacity for drugs, for example, uh, or uh, based on their optical rotation, which if they're in a mixture, you can't separate them easily. And so separations of various optical isomers work based on affinity to other chiral compounds. And that's the way that, they, that they're separated. And, but it's a very difficult task and it's challenging and it's one of the major roadblocks to uh, some drug discovery processes. Uh, so the other way of separating them is by using what's known as a chiral resolving agent. So if you react them with another chiral compound, you may get a reaction that produces one chiral product uh, with, with one enantiomer, one chiral product with the other. And so this is the only other physical property that can be, or it's really a chemical property uh, that can be used to differentiate the two is based on their reaction with another uh, uh, optically active chiral compound. And so you can see here, if you react uh, this mixture of two amines with a chiral acid, you get a preferential uh, formation of one, uh, one uh, enantiomer to the other, and then you can effectively separate them. Uh, practically speaking, what's done in a uh, in a lab that produces, you know, a a particular optical isomer of, of a, a drug molecule, let's say, is the use of what's known as chromatography. And we'll learn more about chromatography later. But uh, what you can do is you can line a tube essentially with a uh, one with a with a reactant that has one particular uh, uh, optical isomer to it. And there will be a differing attraction of one optical isomer in your mixture relative to the other. Uh, uh, and so then that optical isomer will be slowed down due to its affinity or attraction to the one is optical isomer on the tube it's flowing through, or as it's called a column. Uh, and it can be packed with things too. Uh, and so what we can do this with polar substances too, a similar thing. So if you have a polar substance and you pass it through a column like this, it will be attracted to the polar contents and move more slowly through the tube or through the column. Uh, likewise, if you have a optical isomer with a particular affinity to one that's coated in the, in the glass column of the tube, uh, you can then have that one more slowly pass through the tube while the other isomer passes through quickly and the result is that you can separate them from one another. And this is referred to as chromatography. And uh, affinity chromatography is the primary means of separating enantiomers in a practical environment, such as a pharmaceutical lab. Uh, finally, the last topic is alkene isomerism. And so we, at the beginning, talked about how we can differentiate between cis and trans isomers when we have two substituents that are the same. Uh, so here we can say we have cis-2-butane where the methyl groups are on the same side as the double bond versus trans-2-butene where they're on the other side of the double bond. 
But what if these groups aren't the same? What if it's all different groups attached to the double bond? Then you can't use cis or trans. We need a more specific means of naming these. And so, uh, so here we can use this. We can still use cis and trans for this molecule because it has two hydrogens, which are the same. But what about a molecule like this? All four groups are different. We have an ethyl, a fluoro, an amine, and a hydrogen. All four groups are different. Cis and trans won't work here. We can't say two similar groups, two of the same groups are on the same side or opposite sides because there are no two same groups. So instead, we're going to use the so-called E and Z designation. And so E and Z, in E and Z, we prioritize the, group atta the groups attached to each carbon. And like in R and S, we, we give them priorities based on the, uh, atomic, uh, the at atomic number of each of these. So here, the fluoro beats the carbon because fluorine has an atomic number of 9 and carbon has an atomic number of 6. Then on the right side, the nitrogen beats the hydrogen because nitrogen has an atomic number of 5 and hydrogen has an atomic number of 1. And so our groups with higher priority lie on the same side of the double bond. We're not going to call this cis. Instead, we're going to call this Z. And the way I remember that is this kind of the same way I remember cis on the same side. For Z, this means the higher priority groups are on the same side. Okay, uh, so Z here, this would be a Z designation for this double bond because the higher priority groups are on the same side. So if the top priority groups are on the same side of the carbon cobble double bond, we call it Z, which is a German word, Zusamen, which means together. Uh, and if the top priority groups are on opposite sides, like in this one here, the fluorine and the nitrogen are opposite sides of the double bond, we call that the E designation, which stands for Entegegen. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce that in German, but it means the opposite side. And so uh, this moves us beyond cis and trans uh, into a designation that, uh, that works for any double bond, whether it has two of the same groups on either side or, or, or not. When we get to alkenes, we'll talk about how Z and E are integrated into the naming systems. So that, uh, that is the end of our chapter five lectures. Uh, please make sure to practice R and S practice spotting meso groups, okay, and be able to write the name uh, of a uh, a molecule with a chiral center by adding the R and S designations for carbons that are chiral. Uh, and um, I I hope you have a great week, and uh, and I'll see you next time.